Good afternoon. I would like to thank, first and foremost, the Pacifica Institute and the organizers of the Anatolian Festival for inviting me to speak. I would like to thank Ibrahim Barlas, the uh, president in person, for his efforts and for coming up uh, with the title of my lecture. Um, of course, I'm a lawyer. Um, I'm not a historian. Uh, I'm not an expert in the area. Um, I have known Ibrahim uh, Attila and others from Pacifica since mine and our good friend, uh, Istanbul Armenian journalist Hrant Dink, was assassinated in January of 2007. And under his leadership, uh, we were approached and along with many other Armenian organizations, churches, etc., they could find to express condolences and made visits. And that was a, a, a big step which we did not want to, you know, leave unresponded. Um, of course, they had, uh, you know, problems themselves with some of the organizations, which is also understandable. We started a dialogue and not very heavy or spicy as one might expect, but I think it's a step in the right direction. And gradual, cautious, and as long as it's based on good faith and intentions. And I was present and honored to be present, to be here on the initial opening day of the first festival. And I shared my thoughts in a small speech that I gave about Anatolia on that day and what it means to us as Armenians with the good and the hor horrific experiences. Uh, we just hope that future generations anywhere, nowhere in the world, ever experience the tragedies that were experienced and the culture, the music, and the arts that we shared for centuries are properly honored and remembered and passed on to future generations. Again, when discussing a potential lecture and with Mr. Ibrahim, uh, I initially my thought was to limit it to certain aspects of the culture, like architecture, arts, music, during the Ottoman era and in Anatolia. Um, but the uh, title became a little wider than that, and you know, and I'm going to do my best again, not as an expert, but as, but as an avid reader who has developed an interest and who will share it with you. There are dozens, if not more, professors, experts uh, in the field that are 100 times, 1,000 times more qualified than I am um, to discuss the cultural legacy of Armenians in Anatolia. And also, a short half an hour, 45 minutes, or an hour is never going to be enough. And in my brief culture, what I would like to do uh, is to survey the topic, and I hope that at the end of it, I create some interest in you, in what I've discussed, or and beyond. And so you conduct your own research and study it. All I can do is give you some references, perhaps, and you can you know, contact me, or you can ask me at the end of this session, and I will do my best to direct you to the proper sources and proper history. Um, so I'll start with giving you a brief background and history of Armenians in the land, in our homeland. Some are disputed, others controversial, but this is only my view and my reflections. By the way, my views and opinions do not in any way represent the Armenian Bar Association or the Organization of Istanbul Armenians or the Western Diocese of the Armenian Apostolic Church. Anatolia is a Greek word. It means the place where the sun rises, the east. Armenians have inhabited Anatolia and beyond since ancient times. In addition, beyond includes the Armenian plateau. That's located in the eastern end, and again, like I said, beyond, uh, towards Iran and 
towards modern-day Armenia. Initially, the Urartu, and you saw their gate when you came in here, uh, occupied the region, which is our heartland, our homeland. And they were the civilization that was established until they merged with the coming of the Indo-European speaking Arman tribes from the west. Their federation was centered around Van, another city that you see in the festival that's depicted here, along with Akhtamar and all that. The Phrygians and Hittites, along with Urartu, merged into the newly arrived Arman tribes, the Indo-European speaking tribes from Thrace, which is western Turkey, towards where Bulgaria and Greece is, and to comprise the modern Armenian peoples. Beyond that, I would recommend that you read uh, the great professor Richard Hovhannisian's book, The Armenian People from Ancient to Modern Times, for if you want to have more information as to the ancient roots and history of the Armenian people. It is suggested that the ethnic, the, uh, the name Hai, which Armenians call themselves, was taken from the Hathian people without the T, and uh, that relates to the Hittite people whom they met on their way towards where the Urartu lived. Um, as uh, Professor Ovenician states in his introduction, Armenians were located in the ancient crossroads of Orient and Occident, East and West, on a high land located between the Mediterranean, Black, and Caspian Seas. Even the name Zolv, which means it's Armenian for sea, comes from the Urartu word for sea. And they became the buffer and uh, a coveted prize of rival empires, Assyrians, Medes, Achaemenians, which was Iranians of the time, Parthians, Sasanians, Arabs, Seljuk, Mongol, South and East, Romans, Byzantine, Crusaders, uh, Byzantines and the Crusaders from the West. Through all the turbulence, Armenians created a rich and colorful culture and a defensive mechanism for survival. And their became Christians, they were the first nation to become Christians in the world. And part of the reason was they were both affected by the Greeks who tried to make them Greeks and the Persians who wanted to make them Persians and their religions. So Armenian king was the first head of state to accept Christianity. Um, we do have a glimpse to the Armenian culture during the ancient times thanks to writings and special details provided by Greek general Xenophon in, uh, who in four 01 BC led the 10,000 survivors of his army that fought the Persians and they were coming back. It's very interesting because you're going to hear about Armenians written in some Greek generals' diaries from 2,410 years ago. Um, and there's parts of it that I really like. His work is known as Anabasi, the March Up Country, if you want to look it up. He called the large Armenian inhabited area, in quotes, a large and prosperous province, a simple agricultural and tribal society, relatively peaceful despite some local strife, and amazingly wealthy for the times. They lived in strongly fortified villages which were ruled by autonomous village elders, and, they were, and there, there were also princes who ruled larger areas. The main occupations were agriculture rather than trade, and raising of cattle and some famed horses for the time. The Greeks really marveled uh, at the plentiful supplies and sumptuous fare of the country. Xenophon, with amazement, puts lots of emphasis on and lists, in quotes, lamb, kidney, pork, veal, poultry, together with many loaves of bread, some of wheat and some of barley, served at a single uh, single uh, and particular and very much appreciated local form of beer. This is 401 BC, 2,410 years before today. Armenians, uh, either as independent kingdoms or principalities with sovereignty or under Roman, Persian, Byzantine, Arab, Ottoman rule, always registered impressive cultural and economic development and achievements in Anatolia, despite the severe challenges that they faced. 
they served and as Byzantine emperors and top level uh, military officers of Armenian uh, origin. For example, the Macedonian dynasty founded by Emperor Basil I, this is the Byzantine Roman emperor, was Armenian, 867. Um, so there was an enormous presence in Byzantium elite. Uh, similarly, Armenians were also prominent in, with the Persians and the Iranians. So Armenians were on both sides very prominent, very capable, effective, and rose through the ranks. Western Armenia was lost by the Byzantine Empire in 1071 to Seljuk Turks in a famed battle, in Armenian the name of the town is Manasgert, Turkish Malazgirt. While some Armenians, a lot of Armenians, fled south and elsewhere in the world, but a lot of them fled south to the region known as Giligia, near the Mediterranean coast, still a lot of Armenians remained behind and they comp comprised of the majority of the regular population under the Seljuks, who of course, the Seljuks held the military and administrative positions of power. Armenians were culturally very important for the Seljuks. They were regarded as honest and capable, and most important contributions were in the field of architecture. While they maintained the same old, some of the old Armenian techniques and styles though, they created what became known as the Seljuk architecture as they blended elements of ancient Turkish features, the shamanism, uh, structures, um, as well as um, some Persian styles. And you can check that uh, Suud Kemal Yetkin, renowned Turkish expert on the book. Uh, it's referenced uh, a book that he's written about this topic. And um, also a book that just came out called Sadiq Taba, means the loyal subject, by Maxim Yevadyan published by the Gulbenkian Foundation. Um, mainly the buildings consisted of madrasas, mosques, and turbes, uh, large uh, burial tom tombs. Uh, some Armenian architects were also were able to sign their names, and that's why we know there were a lot of Armenian architects in the Seljuk time. We can reference 13th century Malatya's main madrasa was built by Stepan Oulu, son of Stepan Takvor. He wrote his name. Gök Medrese in Sivas, Sebastia, by, done by Kaloyan, architect. And the Konya Medrese by Kalust. This was built, the latter, the latter one, in 1264. And there's, it was known as Inje Minareli Medrese, the Medrese with the narrow uh, minaret. And that, the architect was Kalust. Another common, common element in turbes, which is the Turkish word for burial tombs, large, elaborate burial tombs for important people, uh, started to be built in 12th century, but they were also known as kümbets. The other word for, kubbe, for turbe is kümbet. Döner kümbet, uh, kembet turan, and ulu kümbet. And this comes from the Armenian word kümbet, meaning the dome, kubbe. The technique, plans, heights, and other common features clearly indicates that Armenian architects played a significant role in Seljuk times in Anatolia. Probably the greatest architect of Ottoman era is Sinan. That, in Turkey, unfortunately, is still controversial as to his origins. Um, it is that he was an Armenian boy who was made a Janissary, but it is not disputed um, even by his own autobiography, and every expert agrees that he was a Janissary. Janissary means uh, they would come to Christian families and they would take uh, one kid from each family, either for the military end or for administrative and services. And Armenians and Greeks usually were taken and they rose through the administrative ranks, and the more the Balkan kids, the Bosniaks, Bosniaks, or Serbs, were taken into the military and they would become the fighters. Um, Sinan was born near Kayseri, Gesaria, in a village called Agirnas. He was born in 1490. He was taken from home during the reign of Sultan Selim, 
the Grim, uh, Yavuz Sultan Selim, who reigned from 1512 to 1520. And he was made part of the Janizary regiment and converted into Islam. The only exception to the general rule was Sinan was 30, 30 years old at the time. Usually they took kids from 6 to 20 years of age. And uh, again, based on readings about confirmation, it's probably they thought his family, his parents, and his father, and his grandfather were renowned architects, and they thought he had the genetic uh, capability, and I guess they were in the wrong. The only question is, you know, if you look at the, 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 the controversy, the other side of this is, it could have been Greek, it could have been Armenian. Now, there's some evidence that why he's, uh, I'm gonna quickly go on, and why he probably was Armenian. Um, after the conquest of Cyprus, this is, he's the head architect now, his older Sinan, in 1571, um, had to intercede on behalf of his family. The Sultan had decided after conquering Cyprus that they would send some Anatolian Christians to Cyprus to reduce the percentage of Greeks, like saturate. Thing. So Sinan intervened and his cousins or family members named Sari, Ogul, Nishan and Ulissa to be exempt from the relocation. So if he had to intervene for his family members uh, who were being sent to reduce the percentage of Greeks, it's not likely that they were Greeks. So they were most likely, and Nishan is an Armenian name. He was known as the greatest Ar Ottoman architect. The Suleymaniye Mosque and the Selimiye Mosque are masterpieces, you know, those two, beyond anything else that he's done. Both the Suleymaniye Mosque and the Selimiye Mosque also connect them, connect them to Hagia Sophia, with the, which is the great church, mosque, current day museum built by Justinian, the emperor, in 532 because of the dome. And it connects him to the Ar Armenian architect who's responsible for the present day dome you see in Hagia Sophia. His name was Dirtat. Even though Hagia Sophia was built in 532, around 989, it, Istanbul had a major earthquake and the dome had collapsed. So the emperor sent out for the best architect they could find and they had Dirtat, who had built a lot of the masterpiece cathedrals and other buildings located in Ani, which is in Western Armenia, Eastern Turkey, near the border. And he was brought to Constantinople at the time and he rebuilt the roof, the dome. And what Sinan was able to do in Selimiye, the, it's located in Edirne, not in Istanbul, in Adrianople, in Edirne, is he actually exceeded a great, uh, the, <coughs> the radius of the dome, and that dome is actually wider than what Dirtat had done in Hagia Sophia. Like this is dome without being held by a column, so I'm not an architect, but they say it's like very tough to do, so. Um, While Sinan uh, may still may you know remain not Armenian for some, and that's fine. Uh, they can everybody has the right to their opinion. And the fact that uh, Armenians became the official architects of the sultans is without a question. And uh, Yegyazer, Musa, Hayar Kalfa, Edirneli Agop, Kapyeli Mugurdichan, etc., were the followers of Sinan's footsteps. They were not Janissaries. They worked as Armenians, and they were the palace chief architects of the palace until we get to the most prominent family, the Balians. Total of nine architects, four or five generations. Um, each and every one, the head of the family was the chief architect. And among the most prominent were Krikor Amira Balian, 1767 to 1831. He served for Selim III and Mahmud II, the second one, very reformist sultan towards the end of the 17th century, early 19th century. And he built numerous masterpieces, including several burnt palaces uh, for those who are from Turkey. Um, this will make you know, it more interesting, the Selimiya Kışlası, which is the military barracks located in Istanbul. Uh, the, the Taksim military barracks, which don't exist anymore. The Taksim Square used to be military barracks until the 40s or 50s. And he had built that as well. And of course, the, for Armenians, the, our mother church at the Patriarchate, 
the Surp Atzpatzazin Cathedral, the Mother of God Cathedral, again by the Patriarchate of Istanbul. And he had built, uh, he had a church in Gesaria, Kayseri. And of course, the old Istanbul Mint, which if you visit Topkapi Palace, it's the building to your left when you enter the first courtyard, the original mint where they printed money. Um, if you just decide, if you need more interest in Balians, I'm going to discuss a little more, but read Pars Tulaji, Parsek Tulajian has a great work, three volumes, I think the Balian family and their role in the Ottoman architecture. It's in English, Turkish, and Armenian. Um, the most important one was the next, his son, Karavet Balian, 1800-1866, he built the Dolmabahce Palace that you see around here. And the gate you see here was built by his son, Nigohos Balian. Um, he mixed Baroque and Rococo styles along with some old Armenian uh, styles and techniques. Uh, why do we know this? Because we know that he used to tour Anatolia all the time and he spent a lot of time in Ani, uh, one of our ancient capitals, where there's beautiful buildings including the cathedral that I spoke about. And he served under Sultan Abdul Majid, another great sultan as, you know, of the time that was responsible for a lot of reforms around 1839. Uh, he built Yildiz Mansion, Kuleli Military Building, the, the school, uh, old Chiran Palace, which was rebuilt two more times until it became the current <coughs> hotel in Istanbul, uh, Kempinski Palace. Uh, Surp Pirgic Armenian Hospital, which is a very prominent and still functioning, incredible hospital with the gardens and all that in uh, near Kumkapı. Uh, mosques, churches, Bezmi Alem Valide Sultan Mosque, which is now also known as the Dolmabahce Jami, is also by him. Uh, the Surp Atzvazazin Church in Beşiktaş, which is the Armenian, again, Mother of God Church. Um, it probably has one of the most fascinating altars of any Armenian church. If you ever go to Istanbul, try to visit that. It's small, it's hidden. There's a long story, and I don't want to take up too much time. I can tell you why it is so hidden, why it's so beautiful. They all relate to Dolmabahce Palace. Um, Surp Yeror Tutun, Surp Sarkis in Bandirma, and uh, another church called Surp Lusavaric in Bayburt, were also built by him. And the Harbiye Military Academy and the Jemaran High School in Üsküdar. His son, Nigoos, also built besides the gate, the Hlamur Mansion, Göksu Mansion, and the Ortaköy Mosque, which is uh, featured in a lot of pictures of Istanbul. It's in a nice spot, or cafes and all that, and right under the bridge, the first bridge. Sarkis Balyan, another son, was also chief architect until, through 1899. Um, Sarkis Bay's island, which he built himself and used to live on it and stored is today known to you as the Galatasaray Island, you know, which became part of the team and the team owns it. And that used to be his house. He also built Beyler Bey Palace, the new Chiran Palace, which burned again later, and the Yildiz Palace where Sultan Abdul Hamid reigned. Um, and several hunting lodges that, you know, you need to go to Istanbul, you know, it's Bailan, you know, Balian here, Balian there, and I hope one day he's more recognized and appreciated and uh, certain streets are named after him. The least we can do. Um, I'm going to move on. Another uh, thing that's interesting of Armenian culture in Anatolia is the pottery and ceramic masters of Kütahya. Kütahya is in western Anatolia, not the original homeland of the Armenians. But Armenian artisans had moved there for a long time. And during the Ottoman era, from 16th to 20th century, the Armenian community was very strong there. And there's a book by John Carswell who studies this and uh, explains the basic reasons behind it. And also a book by Garo Kirkman uh, called Magic of Clay and Fire published by the Suna and Inan Kuraj Foundation. Uh, previously, Armenians were in pottery in different regions of Anatolia, 
including Nicaea, which is the rival of Kitahia, Iznik is today's name. But they came from, they had also come from New Julfa, which is way east in Iran. It's the Armenian ghetto of Isfahan. And those pottery masters had moved, some of them, and brought their techniques to Anatolia. Um, according to Kirkman, there were 100 Armenian ceramic masters at the end of 18th century. And by 1914, there were only two left. Europe also attracted most of them, and they were renowned. Uh, if one travels to Jerusalem, the St. James Armenian Cathedral, where the Armenian Patriarch sits, is decorated. And it's all over. Kutahya ceramics and Kutahya pottery and all that. Um, Evliya Chelebi, which is a, who's a famous uh, Islamic traveler uh, who wrote a lot about all over the world, uh, wrote about Kitahya and the manufacturers of pottery and porcelain. And he says in his book that of the 34 neighborhoods in Kitahya, three were Armenian, two Greek. Interestingly, he says that the district where the Armenians lived is called the Chiniji district, the tile makers district. Um, other uh, Armenian cultural things that I would like to share with you and you can follow up on. This photography in the Ottoman Empire was brought by Armenians, famous Abdullah brothers. Their names were Viken, 1820 to 1902, Hopsep, 1830 to 1908, and Kevork, 1839, 1918. They started the first photographic study, uh, studios in Ottoman Empire between 1858 and 1900. They became Sultan's official photographer. Uh, Sultan's liked the Armenians. They all, they all got these. You know. uh, also known and became known in France, very well, Europe and beyond, as Abdullah Frere, the Abdullah brothers, and got work and praise from abroad due to their excellence. The Times magazine covered them with praise when they covered the Paris World Fair in 1878. They also documented uh, a certain tragic side of Armenian history before 1915. Um, while on a mission for Abdul Hamid in 1899 and 1900, uh, they were all over Anatolia taking pictures. And they took pictures of Armenian women and girls working in Hereke, where carpets are made, who were refugees from the massacres of 1894 and 1896. And there were only women there. Theater in the Ottoman Empire was also started by Armenians. The original one was by Siropian Hekimian in 1859. It was called the Shark Teatrosu, Orient Theater. Um, there were numerous actors, all Armenian, but didn't last long. But later on, Ottoman theater was really organized and established under Hagop Vartanian, under the uh, directive of the Sultan at the time. And uh, they became very famous. Uh, there's even pictures taken by Abdullah brothers of Armenian female actors who played the role of Hamlet late 19th century in Istanbul. Most Tur Turkish literary, f literary figures were also connected to Hagop's theater. And I think it's known as Güllü Hagop in Turkish literature. And cultural renaissance, including Namık Kemal, Ahmed Mithat, Şemsettin Sami, and others. This lasted only 10 years, that famous theater, um, because Abdul Hamid uh, shut it down due to a play that depicted his Circassian guard in a bad way. It caused turmoil in the palace. They were all upset. and. He said, shut this theater down. So that was it. But it continued. Subsequent leader of Turkish theater, Ahmed Fehim, who lived until 1930, was a student of Hagop Bartanyan. And he also became the first Turkish actor. OK. Uh, the Armenians were also prominent in the economy of Anatolia and Ottoman Empire. Uh, they uh, were, of course, some of them had no choice. They became businessmen in trades and commerce since they couldn't go to high levels of administrative and military structure. But since 15th century, uh, a lot of trade from India and Iran, Mediterranean to Black Sea and Europe were done by the Armenians. 
And they were the conduits uh, for that and goods to Europe, Ottoman goods being exported. And they were also very famous artisans, shoemakers, blacksmiths, silversmiths, tailors. There's also a silversmith. There's a book written by Osep Tokat. I recommend that you obtain and read about it. And jewelers. Um, just small example about the numbers. This is um, around 1912, 1913, in Sebastia, Sivas. Of the 166 importers, 141 were Armenian. 155 exporters, 127 Armenian. Of 9,800 small businesses, 6,800 were owned by Armenians. Um, agriculture, raising of farm animals in Anatolia were done by Armenians. Um, silk production. That's the last one. The first silk factory, which made Bursa famous, Bursa is a town again in Western Anatolia, was opened by Amira Hagop, Armenian Hagop Celebi Duzian. And this silk was sold everywhere in the world from his factory. Uh, very coveted product. Um, old, it's print shops were brought by Armenians to the Ottoman Empire. Um, starting in 1567, they printed uh, Bibles, but you know, that got, <laughs> at least there was a print shop. Um, I'm almost out of time, but uh, we're many, you know, Armenian intellectuals and uh, we're very, very prominent um, members of parliament. I have to mention Krikor Zorab, who was one of the 350 Armenian intellectuals who were arrested and deported and killed in starting in April 24th. He was an Ottoman true and blue. You should read about his speeches. You should read how dedicated he was. And his other friends, Daniel Borujan and many, many others. And I can go on. And I'm going to stop here. No time for music. <laughs>